stories don't define you, but how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and your storytelling coach to guide you and my podcast guests in collecting your most inspiring, meaningful stories so you can demonstrate your values, skills, and vision. Whether you're interviewing for a job, being interviewed for a podcast or other media, or if you're a leader who wants to truly connect, inspire, and energize any audience. For the past few episodes of the Your Stories Don't Define You podcast, we've focused on a theme of self-reflection as a tool for inspiring leadership and finding greater satisfaction at work and at home. A previous episode published in December 2019 is a perfect addition to this theme, so we thought we'd bring it back for another look. Today's show features Rajkumari Niyogi. I know you're going to love this one. Thanks for listening. Thank you to um, my dear friend, Charlotte Wittenkamp, that I've been connected to on LinkedIn for years and had the opportunity to interview for this podcast a while back. She introduced me to my guest for today, who is Rajkumari Niyogi, and she lives in the Bay Area, and I'm so excited to interview you today. Um, Thank you for joining me. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So um, I always start my podcast recordings by asking my guests to share something about themselves that most people wouldn't know, that you wouldn't find on their resume or on their LinkedIn profile, that they haven't necessarily written a lot about. And I do that because I like for our listeners to have some um, context for who it is that we're going to be listening to and, and hearing some pretty personal stories over the next few minutes. So what do you think? Well, um, I'll just kind of pull the thread on our earlier conversation before we hit record. And you asked me if my last name was Japanese. And I said no, but I get that a lot. Um, Actually, my last name, Niyogi, um, is uh, Indian from India. And it's not actually a last name. It's a title. So um, many generations ago, my uh, great, 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 I don't know which great uh, father, uh, was given a title by the Maharaja, and it, Niyogi actually means employer. So technically, I think I'm from royalty, <laughs> 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 but so far removed that you know, just at the end of the day, I'm a human being. So here we go. <laughs> wow, that is something I wouldn't have known, and I haven't seen any of your writing on that. So that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. My pleasure. Employer. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think that's contributed to your work as a as a leader, as somebody who um, helps guide people? You know, I never made that connection until you just said that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I bet she's going to ask that question. You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, we I spend my days steeped in, you know, relationship dynamics and organizational dysfunction and kind of working through that and talking through those difficult moments with senior leaders across the board. And um, at the end of the day, I always find that we are so easily conditioned through language, you know? Yes. Who's to say? I will actually spend some time now reflecting on that, Sarah. So thank you for giving me that little golden nugget to chew on. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Well, you know, I I think a lot about... um, our names and our stories and how they shape us and create our identities. And I actually interviewed a woman, Dr. Kate McLean, uh, a couple months ago, I think it was like my 98th episode. And she is a researcher in Eastern Washington that actually has said that, and, and has done research along with her colleagues, that the stories that people tell about us contribute to our identity as much as the stories we tell about ourselves. Absolutely. Without a doubt. There's so much research around that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I I mean, who knows? Maybe you heard stories about yourself and where your name came from and those things as a child. And it just kind of created that, that little nugget that you've drawn on and built into something much bigger, a much bigger part of your identity. Uh, without a doubt, you know, and, and I'll, it's so interesting that we're kind of tugging on this thread here around name and identity, you know, Rajkumari actually means princess. And for a long time, I really did not appreciate that being, you know, a non-binary, non-binary, uh, gender non-conforming and uh, masculine center woman. So many labels these days. But, um, 
you know, and, and, and so I went by Raj for a little over 20 years. And yeah. Raj means prince or, or king, as, as many of you know. And, um, and I felt really comfortable in that and, and in my masculinity. And it wasn't until I would say in the last seven or so years where someone made a comment about me not having access to my feminine energy and I, me being very confused about what that even meant as a sentence. And then, you know, spending some time reflecting and, and kind of researching around yin and yang and, and all of these feminine, masculine energies that we both embody. Um, I decided to, to do a, a favor to myself and only go by Raj Kumari, my full name, um, to really kind of invite that feminine energy um, back into my life. I also... Um, I'm looking at my toenails right now and, and they are painted par- sparkly pink. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> that total, okay. That could have been your first sentence of something people wouldn't know about you. <laughs> well, those are the, that's as far as I go. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Even I don't go that far and I definitely identify as female. So that's really interesting. <laughs> I think, you know, there's, I, I didn't know how to embody feminine energy other than, and, and this might sound so kind of um, pedantic really, but to go paint my nails and to do it in a way that I felt safe enough that it wouldn't disrupt my, <laughs> my your outward appearance and your but identity. Absolutely, right. But still to kind of captivate and capture that piece, there's some work I did uh, many, many moons ago around younger versions of self and, what I came to find very quickly is that I had mostly young boys running, running, and ins- running around inside me, and um, and there was one little girl, my seven-year-old, who who really wanted to wear a dress but didn't feel safe enough, and so we, you know, I, I kind of sat down with myself and kind of reflected on how I wanted to address that need or that unmet need, and I'm like, you can have sparkly pink toenails. How about that? <laughs> That will only show if you want them to show. Exactly. You know, it's funny. I it just it just dawned on me. I got a tattoo um, almost six years ago. It was uh, my forty fourth birthday, and I had been wanting a tattoo my whole life, but I never saw anyone that had one that I thought was classy that had um, the kind of outward identity that I associated with myself, and so. For the longest time, I didn't get one. So as you told that story about the sparkly toenails, and it dawned on me that you could cover them if you wanted to, right. that that's something that you were doing for yourself. It wasn't about um, an outward identity. Right. It was about uh, expressing yourself to yourself, giving yourself a reminder and a cue that it was okay. Exactly. And so I'm thinking about this tattoo I got when I was 44. Um, I had wanted one for decades, 20 years or so. And I never got one because I could never figure out an image that was really meaningful to me that, um, that I could live with for my whole life. Because I'm impulsive, but I'm not stupid. So I really, I really thought about it for a couple decades. And um, being raised in a Jewish household, I knew that it was against Jewish law to get a tattoo, and that it would break my mother's heart, that it would be meaningful to her in a negative way. And so I didn't do it for the longest time. And when I finally did, I put it up high on my thigh where it would only show if I wanted it to show and where I could look at it and see that side of myself without necessarily exposing it to others. It was for me. Yeah. And I never put it together like that the way that you just described your toenails. And so thank you. That was a great nugget to hold on to and think about. You're so welcome. And, you know, as as we talk about this, um, you know, even even diving deeper, it starts to kind of bring up thoughts around inclusion, right? And how we kind of um, think about inclusion so much um, in regards to other people and how to be inclusive and how to show up inclusively. Um, But maybe we need to also start thinking a little bit more about how we can be inclusive with ourselves and all the different aspects of what is it that we might not even be aware that we are unintentionally excluding. Yes, absolutely. And that's interesting you bring that up because um, as I think about it, 
that's part of what I do with the Strengths Finder assessment. Mm-hmm. Is I try to help people uncover where their dissatisfaction might be coming from by yeah. looking at their strengths and saying, "Are you including that in your daily life? I love Are it. you valuing it? Because yeah. if you're not, and it's in your top strengths, it's something that comes so naturally to you that you don't even know it's there, and you're not valuing it, then you're going to find some level of dissatisfaction. So that's that's really interesting. This makes me want to ask you about your expertise, because I know you use neuroscience in your coaching, in your executive leadership coaching, and I'm just curious about um, where that kind of fits in with this discussion. Can you enlighten me? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I enjoy using the words neurobiology and epigenetics. Those are two of my favorite words that they're nice and big and, and polysyllabic. And <laughs> <laughs> Embrace that. <laughs> <laughs> and neurobiology is really kind of looking at how our nervous system shows up in the world and how it gets triggered and how it builds relationships and, and how it creates neurochemicals based on the thoughts that we think and the words that we say and the ways in which we show up non-verbally. And so that that world is where I live when I'm speaking to executives every single day and talking about the optimal ways in showing up and the dysfunction that they might be creating. And epigenetics is a relatively newer science the last 30 years or so. And there are two, there are many epigeneticists, um, but there are two that stand out for me and have become sort of my heroes at this point, um, Rachel Yehuda and Moshe Seif. And Rachel Yehuda kind of really brought forward some really interesting research where she actually um, discovered the FKBP5 gene in that what she noticed is in working with um, children of Holocaust survivors, they what she found was that they exhibited um, um, almost identical symptoms of PTSD from the previous generations who actually survived the concentration camps. Um, and Moshe Saif did a study where in 2012 at the university where he actually um, traumatized some baby mice and by doing so turned on a gene called the NR3C1 gene and and what these baby mice, you know, unbeknownst to him, did brilliantly is after they were traumatized, um, they would then run to their adult counterparts and um, get snuggled. And um, over time, what Moshe uh, noticed that was startling to him is that this NR3C1 gene turned off. And what we've come to find is that um, epigenetics is the science of um based on our environment, based on the behaviors that we experience both to ourselves and to others, it actually directly impacts how our genes express themselves. So if we are working in an environment at the office that's incredibly toxic, uh, where there might be a boss who's a bully or a peer who's a micromanager, for example, then we start to notice that we are on guard a lot. And that starts to create a tension in our body. It also secretes um, higher levels of cortisol because we're stressed and we're unsure and uncertain and unsafe. Um, and, and, if, and, and so our body adapts to that way of living. And, and so we start to notice that we're not be enjoying our, our, our job as much as we like, or we might be starting to kind of creep up on burnout, for example. And so if we decide to quit and then move on to a, a, new, a new organization, one where the boss values respect and warmth and welcoming, um, believes in recognition and appreciation on a day-to-day basis, then we might start to notice that our body shifts in a different way. Um, and then it becomes a little more calmer, um, a little quieter, um, and that we actually feel maybe some more joy or happiness or we're wanting to show up and engage and share our thoughts and ideas. So the ways in which we actually show up and behave um, has a direct correlation to the environment uh, that surrounds us, and that has a direct impact on our cellular biology. Wow. That's particularly interesting to me because when I worked for the university system here in Montana, I met a woman, Casey Murphy, Brazil, who is a Native American, and she was studying for her PhD. Um, And she was studying that level of epigenetics where um, 
Native American youth were demonstrating some of the PTSD that their parents and grandparents had actually experienced, even though they hadn't experienced the trauma itself. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, so every single one of us um, has a nervous system on this planet, all 8 billion of us or more. Um, and therefore all of us um, also are impacted by epigenetics. And the research now shows that we as individuals carry the traits and traumas and tragedies um, of our ancestors for uh, 210 years. So that brings us uh, wow. back to 1809. So if you just scan the globe for a moment and just kind of look at all of the different countries and communities and populations, not one of us is untouched by some strife. Not one of us has um, gone without some challenge and some difficulty. And so really this gives us pause to truly step into a place of compassion and a willingness to really connect and support and and show up as a community in very different ways. So tell me about um, early on in your career when you first were triggered by this information um, that you went, oh my gosh, this explains so much and I have to know more. When did that happen? Who was it that they... I mean, obviously, for me, it's... I, okay, let me back up a little why I'm asking you this question. Um, it's because when um, when I had a boss that was very abusive to me and I really, really struggled and I didn't feel like I had the luxury to walk away, I stayed for over two years with wow. this woman who was extremely cruel to me. This is a person that um, really took down my confidence in a way that very few people had been able to do in my life. And that that's saying something because <laughs> I've had a, I've had a few people that have tried to do that. And um, when I first started with my new job with the uh, afterward um, and I had a woman that showed up after I had started and she ended up being my boss's boss. And she said something very cruel to my boss about me. And he passed it along to me and said, don't worry about it because I trust what you're doing and don't worry about it. And shortly after that, it must have been about three months after she started, she called me into her office and, and gave me this sheet of paper. And I thought for sure it was like some nasty write-up about what a terrible person I am, what a terrible job I'm doing. Even though I knew, I knew that that wasn't the truth. But I read this paper and it was acknowledgement of hard work that I had put in with a bonus and a change of my title, a positive change. And I remember reading this thing twice sitting in her office and thinking that can't be what I'm reading because mm -hmm. I, I, and that, so I walked away from that realizing that that's what PTSD looks like. Mm -hmm. Even on a small scale, like employer abuse, as opposed to war and tragedy like that. Um, it still, it still shows up and it did impact the way that I behaved in some ways. Yeah. Um, but that triggered some really interesting writing for me. That particular experience of looking back and saying, oh my gosh, why did I react that way? Why was it so hard for me to believe that she was recognizing my value? Right. And that's part of what drove me to become a coach to deal with this kind of interaction. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm asking you, what was it that triggered it for you? Well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge uh, your your story. Thank you so much for sharing um, so so courageously and so intimately. Wow, what a, what a journey that must have been for you. Oh, it continues to be. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I want to for try, I wanted to initially respond facetiously and say it started when I was four. Um, but then as you told your story, I, I, I then I arrived a little more recently in my life. So, it, you know, for me, something very interesting happened. I, I spent some time at Facebook. I was there for a little over two years. And uh, my boss, Stuart Crabb, absolutely amazing human being, uh, just, you know, uh, a walking entity of magic. As I always say, if you ever have a chance to meet him, please, please do. I also had a really great team. I, I was, I loved my role. I was doing compliance and legal global education rollout. So, you know, in charge of things like sexual harassment training and um, FCPA and code of conduct and all those fun things. And um, even though I 
loved my job. I loved my boss. And I really enjoyed my team and was making the most uh, money I'd ever made in a salary. I felt excluded almost the entire time I was there. And that was incredibly confusing to me. And so I do what most people do after they've endured cruelty as you did and pain and being ignored for way too long. I quit. Um, and so I left for Southeast Asia to decompress, eat a ton of noodles and do some research around why the heck did I feel excluded when my boss was absolutely amazing and I loved working at Facebook. It was very confusing. And what I came to find was a journey into what exclusion actually does to the brain and how important psychological safety and the ability to include oneself and others creates this sense of belonging and what it does to have a sense of belonging at a neurobiological level down to our cellular structure and how that resonates outward into our team and our department and our organization, our community, our personal life, our families. And so that really was where the moment of my journey began into this, into this work. So when you look back, can you pinpoint any particular behavior that made you feel like you were excluded? You know, so I, I can. <laughs> Good. I, I'm a little hesitant to, to, to start there because, you know, as, as I do the work that I do, I'm an epigenetic, I'm an executive coach through the lens of epigenetics and, and neurobiology. And, you know, what we look for when we're looking through the lens of epigenetics is patterning. I think, I think we all are looking for patterning when we look at data or we look at why things didn't work or when we look at things that did work, right? And we, and we tell a story from that pattern. And if I were to kind of rewind a little further back into my childhood, what I would start to notice and then be able to share with you is the patterning of neglect. And so as I experienced this patterning of neglect, that conditioning then comes with me as I move into adulthood and I start playing out those very same patterns. The opportunity then as coaches and as individuals who do work with others to help um, them reach their highest potential is to interrupt that patterning that doesn't serve us and to start to choose patternings that take us to places of joy and well-being and connection and safety. So let me back up a little. What, what I think I'm hearing you say is that even if the behaviors weren't necessarily intended as exclusion or even somebody externally wouldn't have seen them as exclusion because of your patterning, you would have um, approached it that way, regardless of what the intention or the, the reality was around it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense because that's kind of, that's the work I do with internal messages and where they came from. And exactly. um, one of the big ones that you just hit on is feeling like you're not part of something and that you're left out somehow. And I had this conversation with another podcast guest because she was born to um, a German mother and an American father in France. And she never, no matter where she lived, she never felt like she fit in. And she's a few years behind me age-wise. And I explained that I always felt that way too, that I never felt like I really fit into any particular group. But that at some point, this must have been what you're describing as, as kind of interrupting that pattern. I realized I didn't want to fit in with a particular group. I wanted to create my own. Right. Uh, absolutely. And then, you know, as, as, as a coach, I would then step in and say, you know, ask all the questions of, of why. Why did you want to? Why didn't you fit in uh, or didn't feel like you fit in? And when we look at something that you said earlier, not part of something and feeling left out, if we just kind of look up for a moment to just a few generations um, before us, you know, how many groups were actually left out? How many groups felt they weren't part of something? Probably everyone to some degree. Right. right. At some point, Absolutely. for sure. 
Absolutely. And all, all of those mindsets, you know, we have to understand that epigenetics is about the titration of mindsets, that we are carrying the mindsets of what our ancestors went through with us. And so the compassion opportunity here is to realize that so much of what we think isn't actually ours. And then the question becomes great. So if it isn't actually mine, what is mine? Well, what would you like yours to be? Because the reality <laughs> is you can create anything you want. So choose a new mindset, right? Honor that which came before you because you're here because of them. And that's very important. And create that experience that you would like more. So when was the first time you were able to successfully do this for yourself? Wow, what a great question. I'll, I'll, be, a, I'll be very vulnerable on your podcast and, and share a moment that I hardly share at all. There was, I was living uh, in, in, in Menlo Park, uh, you know, on the cusp of Palo Alto and Menlo Park, about a mile and a half from Facebook. And um, I, had, I had just left Facebook and I'd come back from Southeast Asia and I was like, okay, I'm going to build this coaching company. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to do all these things. And I'm going to, you know, make a bazillion dollars by selling courses on Udemy, which by the way, I made $42. And <laughs> as I'm going for my, you know, my, my, my daily afternoon walk on University Avenue that I felt so inspired by, I'm walking along. It's the afternoon, it's about four o'clock. And I'm thinking about all the things I'm about to build for the next week and, put my ideas together and all of a sudden I hear you realize you're going to completely fail right and I and I kid you not I stopped in my tracks and I looked behind me I'm like what and there was nobody there because it was four o'clock and everyone's you know doing their commute and I heard it again and I remember being completely paralyzed on the sidewalk going where the heck is this inner voice coming from and I took a breath and I, I checked in and I, I didn't know. I just didn't know. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to build a successful company by listening to that voice. It's just not going to happen. And in that second, I did a U-turn, walked to my car, kid you not, got in my car, drove to Ocean Beach and sat there and talked to that voice to find out what the heck was happening and why that part of me was so scared. And um, and it was a really really enlightening conversation. Well, I recorded it as a teaching a teaching tool for my clients. I haven't played it in, in over five years, um, but but it really was my younger version of me, a four year old who had just experienced divorce um, from her parents and feeling so isolated and so sad and just really kind of despondent that I had lost my family and it was Christmas when that happened. And, and uh, it was that I realized later, um, much, much later that that core belief of failing and never making it and losing a family um, was really impacting the success of my, my personal and, and personal life and, and, and professional to some extent. Wow. Yeah. And so I worked with that voice and, and through the work of, um, you know, right hemisphere experience where talking um, soothingly and compassionately to oneself. This is all documented research. There's a great book by Sarah Payton called Your Resonant Self that walks you through rewiring neural pathways from your prefrontal cortex back to your amygdala so that you can develop a, a calmer, kinder voice with yourself. All, there's so much out there. Um, and, and doing that kind of very... Um, slowly and patiently and rebuilding those neural pathways for myself to have a kinder relationship so that I could build a company, so that I could have the experiences, the community, the friendships, the amount of money that I wanted and have over time created. And it has been, it has been a stunningly wonderful journey. Raj Kumari, thank you so much for sharing that vulnerability. That is I got a chill when you said you got in your car and drove to Ocean Beach because um, I I knew what that took for you to stop that conversation where it was and explore it rather than sink into it. Or dismiss it. Or dismiss it, which is worse. Right. Because it was going to be there regardless. Clearly, it came out of left field, literally. <laughs> well, you thought it did. 
You exactly. thought it did, but it clearly didn't. Exactly. Um, exactly. And that's, I think we forget that, that we, we think that something comes out of nowhere, but it never does. Correct. It never does. There are always clues exactly. throughout our lives. But I think the beauty of your story is that you can look back now and know that that was your pivotal moment. And that was the moment that you could change things for other people because you had experienced it yourself without a doubt thank you for for highlighting that and spotlighting that that's that's quite sweet thank you that's pretty amazing story so when you think about your four-year-old self (laughs) was there an interaction that um, made you feel like you were responsible for the falling apart there, so what a great question. There was, in fact, um, it was younger than that. Um, and there was a moment where my father and mother were arguing. And I remember um, getting, I think I might have been three, actually, getting in between them, standing in between them. This was in Canada and Nova Scotia. And, uh, you know, my father's six, three or whatever. Six, oh, gosh. I'm three, you know, so. Right. <laughs> this is, You're up to his oh, knee. <laughs> exactly. And I remember pushing him on his on his legs and him walking backwards. And he I literally pushed him out the back door. Now, of course, let's be clear, he allowed me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Clearly you weren't that strong. <laughs> if he didn't want to go, he wouldn't have gone. <laughs> right. But that never left me. That that moment I thought I was so powerful. Now, it could have been, and I've never really brought this up with my father, maybe I should, um, is that he was frustrated <laughs> arguing with my mother <laughs> and decided to take it as an opportunity <laughs> to actually walk out of the house. And it just so happened that I was touching his leg and I encoded that as I pushed him out of the house. <laughs> you know? Well, I'm sure that's what it was. Right. It, it, if you think of the context of the situation, right? you think of where your mom and dad were at that moment. Take yourself and your own feelings and emotion out of the picture. And you look at the picture from um, the perspective of of an observer Mm -hmm. and you see this three-year-old pushing her dad and she feels very powerful in that moment because she is actually feeling like she is contributing to his movement. So this three-year-old is feeling very powerful and pushing and the father is looking down out of anxiety, frustration, and the reality that He doesn't want to hurt his little girl. Right. Because he knows that what is going on between him and his wife is hurting her. And so he walks away from it rather than continue to to push that and put the pressure on that three-year-old who's pressuring him. Exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think that, you know, we we talked about this before we started our, our recording today. You know, we talked about, um, you know, where things where things actually come from and, 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 and the conditioning and the core beliefs. And, you know, that moment also never left me, never left me. And the, the fact that I <laughs> how tall is a three year old? Right. I know they all vary, but how tall is a three year old? I felt so powerful, so powerful and so um capable of doing anything in that moment yeah and I think that stuck with me I think in the moments of difficulty is going to kind of just roll up my sleeves and go okay I'll just just figure this out I'll just make this happen and somehow that has happened each and every time through every you know turn that I have encountered that has been challenging or there have been impediments or roadblocks figuring out a way to come go around that Wow. I keep thinking about the dichotomy in that moment. You, you felt powerful enough at three to move a mountain. (laughs) And yet a year later, you're blaming yourself for moving that mountain. Wow. Beautifully said. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how the common denominator of failure in my family was in fact me. Right. At, at, you know, because as a child, you know, that, you know, four or five or six or seven, 
you know, we're, the world still is revolving around us because we're still figuring out how to individuate and what it means to be on this planet. As a being and well, until we're 16, really. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even further than that, but <laughs> <laughs> some people who keep it their whole lives. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, that 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 is uh, such an interesting connection that I've never made and I really appreciate uh, and I'm grateful for. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Well, and think about this. Um, because you've connected those two images. Sometimes when you push really hard, like when you did when you were walking down university after you left Facebook, you still had that conflict. I am powerful. I can do this. I, when I'm powerful, I cause failure. Mm. Wow. I think that has been um, some variation, some version of that has definitely been uh, something I've been working on for, for quite some, quite some time. And I think, you know, what, what I just spent a month in Bilbao, I just got back a week ago. I took in an 11 day, uh, business class on systemic business management. It was mind blowing for sure. And, uh, it was also very intensive because we worked from 9 a.m. to, uh, 9 p.m. every single day and three hour break. And we had 14 countries represented in 25, 2014. Wow. So fantastic to have that. Um, and one of the things, you know, we, when we were doing our, doing our introductions, um, the teacher was asking, what do you want out of this class? And I said, professionally, you know, I'd really like to look at how to shift systemic, systemic core issues like racism and, 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 and things like that within organizations. Um, but at a personal level, I would really like to look at why I have such a need for recognition. And I think I'm putting all this together in this very short podcast. Can Talk I about a pattern. And because there's, I want to learn more about myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so just, you know, kind of going back to your comment about, you know, when I'm powerful, things break. It, that has been absolutely um, an opportunity for growth for me in the last few years, finding and acknowledging my power and allowing that power to be present and knowing that I can embody that power without necessarily having to break anything. Not being fearful of it. And not being fearful. And that has absolutely been my journey of not being afraid of, of my own power. For wow. Sure. Wow, I'm kind of reeling over here. How about you? Yeah, I'm I'm really excited. I'm actually quite serious about next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank wow. you for that insight there, sir. You're welcome. And thank you for sharing it. This is um this has been a an incredible conversation and kind of a, a total wild card because my only interaction with you up till now, up till we started talking an hour ago, was um, through Charlotte Wittenkamp, and then email and looking at your LinkedIn profile. So I'm just, I'm so grateful, first of all, for Charlotte, because she knew, she's talk about insightful. She knew we would connect like this. Mm. Um, but also, I'm, I'm so grateful that you are, you are who you are and that you're choosing to self-reflect to the extent that you are so that you can make a big difference and, and help people and bring that safety and security to other people so that they can bring it to their communities. Thank you for saying so. I think one of the things I talk a lot about when I'm working with teams or individuals is, you know, we can make the impact uh, we can to the extent that we know who we are. Right. I just was speaking to Hannah Bratterud about the fact that you can't really help other people if you're experiencing your own pain. You can't figure out what other people's pain is when you're in the middle of your own. Right. I, I think, you know, I think I'm not necessarily sure that I fully agree with that. I think there's an opportunity to be in that pain and share that pain and to some degree then understand what that pain is about, have that mirrored back, and then use that feedback to move forward, um, and then and then disseminate those learnings out to those who have similar experiences. If you know you're in pain, 
Correct. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. And I and I think and I know that you have had plenty of experiences with people who don't realize they have something to learn, that don't realize they have an underlying dissatisfaction they haven't addressed. And they they cannot be the leader they want to be as long as they don't acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I recently had just a, about three or four months ago had someone, um, a very successful salesperson in an organization, ask me what the value of self reflection was. Uh-huh. Um, and I, and I really, I, you know, I, I will say I was quite, chag- I, I am quite chagrined to, to share my response. I, and I, I answered her question, but the chagrined element is that I, I was annoyed <laughs> and I wasn't able to, I think I may have displayed that annoyance a little too much. And, um, and I was frustrated and I, I left that meeting asking myself, what is it that frustrated me about that question? Because as a coach, that's, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to answer questions and I'm here to, to partner with someone and support them on their journey um, as they travel through whatever they're traveling, their own landscape. So what was your answer? Why were you so frustrated? What, what did that signify in you? Uh, you know, I think what a fantastic question. I, I think, I think it just played out a little bit about my own mother and father and their lack of self-reflection and understanding the pain and the trials and tribulations that we went through as a, we have gone through as a family and the lack of accountability in, in that. And, yes. and so in that reflection, I was so frustrated that I wasn't able to a hold kind of um, an equitable stance for this client. Um, but B was grateful that I had that experience so that I could connect that frustration to the lack of accountability from both of my parents. Do you think it could also be that you've been doing this long enough that it just felt like a slap in the face almost? <laughs> like I've been, I, I just, I know that might sound <laughs> a little weird. The reason I say this is my interview with Lorraine Flower a couple weeks ago. Um, I asked her how she keeps from getting discouraged um, and she is she is a coach to leadership teams as well um, in the UK. And she um, she's a big believer in bringing humanity back to the workplace and really showing up as your full self. And I I do that as well through different workshops. And my my topics are my themes are a little different, but the whole end result is this the hope that our workplaces will shift so that people will be able to bring their, their whole selves to work and really everybody benefits from that. Mm -hmm. And so I asked her how she keeps from getting discouraged. And, and she said, I have to take myself out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Yep. I I have to know that um, I'm, if I bring my best, most authentic self with the right, with it, with my intention, the way that it needs to be, that it's right. not about me, that I just have to trust that things will shift the way that they're supposed to shift. Oh, without, without I, a doubt, without a doubt. And I wonder if that was part of your frustration is that, um, you know, that moment of discouragement, like I've been working so hard for so many years to help people be self-reflective. It's such a natural instinctive thing for you that that frustration is like, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Maybe, you know, I, I don't know. And, and for sure, yes, to some degree, absolutely. But, you know, then, then for me, in kind of being hard on myself or, you know, kind of in hindsight, looking back, what I would have preferred is to say, to, to give the definition of, of self-reflection and, and the value of it, and then follow it with, maybe I'm not the right person for you to continue this process with. Yes. You know, and, and yeah. I didn't do that, but it, it was fine because it was actually our last session and I was working for an internal client. It's a different story, but, uh, and all that kind of um, worked out on its own anyway, which was fantastic. Um, but, you know, I, I, oh, wait a minute, let's back up a little. And, and just so you know, I think I was probably just projecting right there about your frustration. <laughs> but uh, Let's back up a little. How many times have you met with that person that asked you that question? Um, Maybe a total of seven. Huh. So that person just was, it, that person was your mother. That person was your father. 
after seven visits, they still didn't get it? And for sure. And, and that was where I was going next with my point was, <laughs> and, you know, it, I, I say, you know, to my close friends jokingly, I love my job because I get, I get paid to do my own therapy every session. you know and I really do and 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 the hilarity of that even is that my clients are so aligned uh unconsciously that we have themes every week that they're working on it's it's hilarious to me like they'll come with the same issue you know they're across the world uh working on these particular themes and then I get to do my own work and even though I'm showing up for them um through 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 a mirror and a lens and and someone who holds um, the capaciousness of, of neurobiology and, and and epigenetics, um, I still get to draw nuggets from each session and allow myself to to grow and to be nourished by my own learnings through their insights. Well, and you know, I was thinking about that too because I feel the same way. I actually wrote a post many uh, when I first started coaching, aha moments in coaching, and it was about the fact that I get to uncover some of my own issues. Um, and then I actually have a coach because I, I can't imagine being a coach without having a coach and, and putting my money where my mouth is saying, I, I believe in this so much that I have one myself. But the other aspect of that is that because of your ability to see as a mirror and do your own work, that's part of what makes you such a good coach is that you haven't stopped learning yourself. Right. Right. Absolutely. I, I think um, I, I feel very fortunate to be partnered with someone who is also um, obsessed with learning about self and, and other things, information. Um, and, and so that I think that's a value that we share pretty nicely. Um, I, I also am fascinated with people who aren't interested in learning about who they are. That is fascinating. And, and you know, there's a value in that, too in recognizing that everyone is different and that there are people who find their comfort in that place. I, I, I think about that because um, I think about people in my life that are not self-reflective and, um, and I used to get really frustrated with that. And then I realized who, who am I to say that they're unhappy in some way because of that? Right. You know, for me, what what that that often brings up this this epigenetic lens because then I start to kind of explore. Well, in that in that need to not self reflect, what I think the story I'm telling myself about them or, or that population or that community is that they're ensuring their survival. Yes, not in not change ensures that they continue to be here on this planet and that's a very that's a very lofty goal for for a lot of us hmm. wow yeah, i hadn't thought of it that way <laughs> but it is a, a it's a um, self protection mechanism absolutely you know there there's absolutely yep if i it's easier to not think about how you contributed to the damage in your life <laughs> It's a lot easier. <laughs> and let's also be clear that, you know, when we when we talk about the nervous system and we talk about working through the trauma or the PTSD, the, the, the body has to completely engage in a transformation that allows itself to reconstruct and redesign um, its essential being. And that in and of itself is is terrifying. We we are a walking bag of neurochemicals, you know. We are a chemistry lab that is. That is a really ugly visual. <laughs> <laughs> and but but it's true. Every thought sparks a neurochemical experience. Uh, I remember when I was um, my my girlfriend and I were arguing, and and I and I said some neurochemical statement, <laughs> and she said, "Don't reduce our love to brain science." <laughs> that was really. Funny. <laughs> well that's what it is but <laughs> I, I couldn't actually keep arguing that point after that it was so funny we both burst out laughing but um but it is, it is that is what it is and I think to understand that and and to understand the ways in which the environment and the way that we treat ourselves um has a direct correlation to how we feel um really invites us an opportunity to make choices 
that take us down the path of our greatest potential. Mm. To make choices that take us down a path of greatest potential. Yeah. That's an awesome statement right there. Wow. I don't think I can add to that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's really, when you think about it, that's the whole point of all of this. It's the point of learning about our brains and learning about how the environment impacts how we feel about ourselves and about the world around us. And the fact that we are all about our chemicals and that we can't be reduced to that because they shift based on our environment. Exactly. Exactly. And I was, you know, I, I've been, I've been a little challenged in the last few years, um, given our, our political climate and our, our, and our actual climate. <laughs> and, yes. And, you know, just, um, when you talk about hope that, that is a place that I have really kind of been standing and, 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 you know, kind of scratching my head and, and holding my heart around is, is how do I create more hope for myself doing the work that I do in the world? And, and I, and I really have been, been asking that question in, in, in very, very, in, in different degrees, let's say. And just yesterday, actually, I watched I, for the fourth time, but this time it seemed to have landed differently. Um, Alan Watts's video about life is not a journey. And, uh, and how everything is about being playful and how the cosmos in and of itself embodies playfulness, how dancing and music is all about playing. It's about in experiencing the moment and having that joy to the, to the greatest degree that we can possibly experience it. And after watching that video, which is just a few minutes long, and realizing it really is about being playful and joyful. There, there really isn't anything else other than that moment, every moment, having the maximum capacity of joy. Mm. I just immediately turned to ma- maximum capacity of joy also includes your maximum capacity of grief because they're so interconnected. When I think about um, the loss of my father five years ago, I still have this, I realize that the the grief is part of where I find joy and the joy is part of where my grief is. I think that the the interplay between grief and joy provides the contrast in order to transition from one to the other. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't even um I don't want to end this, <laughs> but I know <laughs> I know that our listeners are probably finishing up their commute <laughs> and they have to get out of the car and either go in and feed kids or go work out or go to work, whichever part of their commute they're exploring. Um, And Rajkumari, I am just so grateful for the time that you've taken, the vulnerability you've exposed and the experiences and expertise that you've shared. It has been a pretty incredible hour. I feel the same. Thank you so much, Sarah, for taking me on this journey and partnering with me in this beautiful exploration of you and me and us. Yes. Sounds like a Martin Buber book. <laughs> I am going to, for, for our listeners, um, I'm going to include some links for Raj Kumari's um, LinkedIn profile and um, her website in the blog post associated with this podcast. I'll also include some links to some of the people and videos and books that she's mentioned during this conversation. Raj Kumari, thank you so much for joining me. And I look forward to continuing this conversation and our relationship well into the distant future. Thank you. Absolutely. It would be a great honor and a pleasure, Sarah, to do the same with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. I'm putting some finishing touches on a new course, Get the Offer, Job Interview Storytelling, that will be available online in early fall 2022. It is so important that this course is truly relevant, helpful, and useful for my clients. So I'd love your help. Would you please email me at sarah at elkinsconsulting.com or complete the form that's linked on the blog post associated with this podcast episode to add your ideas for the course? I'd love to know your biggest challenges when it comes to job interviews 
so the content of my online course is exactly what you need. I appreciate your help. Thanks in advance.